Okay, we're making a start in biology of fishes. I'm told uh, by my colleagues here that it's the 16th of October. It's a good thing I got somebody to keep me straight this morning. Uh, that's today, 16th of October, and we're going to talk about growth in fish, sort of wrapping up bioenergetics, the logical uh, focus of bioenergetics, one of them. And then we've also got a lab coming up, um, and I've already got the links posted all the way through the help files, and I've gone ahead uh, for sake of people that are trying to make progress faster than we are, some of us at least. I've gone ahead and converted the help files for Lab 4 to uh, the MOV format so that they'll be available. You will need to wait for the Lab 4 compiled data that will come back, I hope, toward the end of this week. Um, the handout and the simulation model that is the right version for Lab 4. And then an extra model are all posted now on the server. And uh, this uh, black and white version of the PowerPoint show, the data template, are all available. Of course, we won't have proceedings until we're finished today. Um, spent some time um, grading, I started to say worrying with, I guess that's the right word too, the part of the exams over the weekend, and uh, many of you, most of you, I'd say, will need to invest more effort than you've been investing, and you need to get the most out of the points that are available in the lab, because that's going to be the difference for many of you between uh, the grade that you're going to get and the grade you'd like to have in the course. I mean, that's been the pattern in this course, is people save themselves in lab, but it takes an effort, as you know already. Uh, we're uh, over the hill, I'd say, and then the downhill run on lab. Lab three reports are due today. I realize that some of you may be behind on lab three because of other obligations, including getting ready for the exam. <coughs> so all I can say is try to get it in as soon as you can. And the rest of us, uh, you too, I hope, will keep moving ahead and uh, doing Lab 4 work today. Well, for now, let me uh, wrap up uh, this part of the course and uh, deal with growth and growth models. And the next, uh, there's a major division between this, the end of this lecture and the beginning of the next session having to do with, okay, we've sort of set the stage uh, with a consideration of uh, environments that fish deal with and the basic biology of fishes and some of the ecology, the odd ecology, relative to uh, adaptations um, of fish as a group. And now, uh, in the next uh, section, I want to deal with um, the adaptations that individual fish make to variation in environment, not just to the, the uh, patterns, uh, steady state patterns, but to the, to, to the changes in those patterns through time and space. And that's going to be the thing that we will spend the rest of the time in the course on. First, though, we need to uh, conclude our consideration of, uh, of bioenergetics by talking about uh, the emergent property that is of most interest to most folks, and that's growth. You know, I've set the stage for this by talking about uh, uh, the uh, balanced energy budget and uh, its components and tried to uh, give you some um, insight as to how the components are affected by environment. <coughs> And I've pointed out all along that growth is the, the resultant. Um, once you've accounted for everything else, then what you've got left uh, is available to allow fish to either grow or to lose weight, depending. And uh, so I want to sort of uh, finish up uh, here today on talking about that by looking at some of the work that's been done in the realm of fisheries. Uh, 
regarding growth. You know, we've sort of uh, dealt with the bioenergetic perspectives, and now I want to deal with the more empirical perspectives. And at the end, I'd like to bring those two back together. Um, the conventional perspective um, comes from fisheries work, uh, folks looking at catches of wild fish. Uh, obtained commercially or uh, experimentally and uh, and trying to determine the progression of sizes of fish through time so size at age studies sort of form the basis of patterns of growth in fish we get these growth curves by plotting the standard length or total length uh, in the case of uh, Scombrid's uh, fork length actually uh, or weight against um, time uh, or, and hopefully against age, although it's easy to know time. I mean, that's an arbitrary measure of, of how the past is moving into the future, but knowing how old the fish is is a little more difficult. So we can measure time as, as the difference between now and some reference point, like hatching in the case of hatchery fish, we know when that was, may not know it for wild fish, particularly uh, species that tend to have multiple spawnings. So we may have to do uh, an analysis of hard parts to try to estimate age of the individual. And you can do that by looking at what we call growth checks on things like scales, and that's the traditional thing, um, or uh, centra of vertebra or branchiostical bones or something uh, odorless perhaps in the fish and you can even uh, for small fish young fish you can even uh, estimate uh, age in days since uh, some initial event uh, by looking at uh, numbers of, of not annuli, which imply a year, but circuli. And these circuli tend to be formed on a daily basis. And that's a re relatively new development, I'd say, in the last 30 years or so. Folks have really started to focus on circuli, uh, on things like odalis. And the surprising thing about circuli is that they tend to form day by day, even in the case of fish that are... Um, variously treated, for example, starved. So it's some sort of uh, rhythm that tends to persist. And it works pretty well, although it requires uh, really some careful uh, technology, like polishing slices, very fine slices of odalis, staining techniques, that sort of thing. Another way to do this, uh, just with the data without the animal in hand, is by looking at uh, the progression of sizes through time, progression of the distribution, uh, modal progression it's called, where what you are hoping is that there will be a distinctive uh, peak in the distribution of fish of the same age, and that you can simply follow the movement of that peak through time to uh, estimate growth rates or age and then look at the sizes and the size change to get growth. Uh, all of this is complicated, I said, by uh, the fact that in nature you don't get uh, single size classes. Uh, you may get year classes if you're fortunate. In the case of fish that only spawn uh, in one big pulse each year, but lots of fish, uh, centrarchids, for example, bluegill, have uh, multiple spawns throughout the season. So fish can be uh, different by months in age within the same year class. And that means that all of the sizes are just sort of smeared together through time. And there have been lots of efforts to statistically resolve these multiple uh, peaked or multimodal distributions by making assumptions about the underlying distribution and then estimating total variance and looking at the partitioning of variance to try to decide, um, to try to separate the age classes or the groups, cohorts. Uh, that's the pattern that you 
uh, are told is the is the typical pattern of weight or size. Uh, this is weight here through time or with age from some starting point like hatching <coughs> or metamorphosis or recruitment to the gear. Uh, for example, the sane recruitment in the case of the little red drum in the bays. And the pattern you expect to see is the, is the sigmoid pattern. And uh, I've got it distorted here. Probably the, the pattern is more characteristically uh, squinched or skewed to the left there where this uh, lag phase is much shorter than I've suggested so that the whole thing looks more like just a, an exponential or a simple hyperbolic instead of a power hyperbolic. Anyhow, the sizes over time of the cohorts and of the individual fish within the cohorts uh, tend to approach an asymptote that is called by fisheries folks weight infinity or length infinity in the case of length. And I've indicated it here by this dashed line. This weight infinity um, is not to be confused with what we've uh, talked about before, which is W max. Um, weight infinity is uh, the ecological maximum for weight or ecological maximum for size, if we're talking about length, as opposed to some physiological maximum. And logically, um, one would expect that weight infinity, the ecological maximum, would be less than the true physiological W max because ecological conditions have to be ideal in order for fish to achieve their physiological uh, capacity under ecological conditions. W max, you'll recall, uh, reflects the maximum size uh, that can be achieved given the fact that rates of food processing and food acquisition um, find different asymptotic values with size than, than rates of, of energy use to support that metabolism. And typically the rate at which the supply curve falls is faster than the rate at which the use curve falls, and that means the two are going to intercept at some finite size, and that's the point I made last time. So we can actually estimate W max by solving the bioenergetics model with expected maximum uh, functions for the components. But the ecological maximum, this W infinity, reflects uh, a, a, a cost and uh, supply problem that's a little different. It, it suggests that... Um, as the fish gets bigger, the uh, likelihood that it will achieve its maximum needs in terms of food finally uh, uh, falls to, to equal the value of that food. So we would say that, that W infinity reflects a balance between the bioenergetic value of consumed food and the costs associated with finding and eating and processing the food. And the costs increase with increasing weight. So we can expect that this weight infinity is going to vary with changes of food availability and with environmental quality. And environmental quality tends to change seasonally, so we would certainly expect to see um, what are called growth stanzas. So here's really a resolution of the pattern I showed you earlier resolved on a, on a, a finer scale. And um, this, uh, this pattern reflects, uh, sort of contains smaller sigmoid patterns reflecting changes in uh, the asymptotic value for each stanza. So here we talk about three stanzas, and you can see the little component sigmoid curves within each of the stanzas. And those are always there, but we don't often... Uh, we don't always see them. Uh, fisheries folks don't. You can see easily that if you only go out and sample once a year, and these are annual stanzas, then you know you might only 
pick one point on the curve each year and you wouldn't be able to see the fact that there's this characteristic systematic wiggle. Um, these are caused by two things. The uh, change in environment um, in terms of physical chemical environment as well as by changes in food availability that could be linked to the physical chemical change. So I've got some examples here for you or some, some I guess, uh, additional considerations and by way of, of representative details um, of things that can happen as fish grow from little fish to big fish. And here's a, a, the problem of growth dispersion uh, which enters into this picture. So what we got is a whole bunch of fish that uh, have a strongly peaked low variance distribution, those kinds of distributions are said to be leptocurtic, L-E-P-T-O, leptocurtic. I don't know if I've got the word anywhere in the handout. And then as time passes, they become progressively flatter with higher variance. Uh, they're said to be become more platy, P-L-A-T-Y, platycurtic. So here at T0, we've got a very strong... Uh, peak distribution of little fish. Um, fish can't have negative weights, so we're always going to be truncated, uh, constrained on the, on the left by zero. As time passes at T1, the distribution is starting to spread out. This is the natural consequence of variation in the abilities of individual fish that might be genetic. Maybe they're just luck. Some fish are finding more to eat, finding slightly better in environmental conditions and are growing a little faster as a result. Others are, for whatever reason, kind of being stunted. And the more time that passes, the more this situation becomes extreme and becomes um, this typical growth dispersion pattern that you see in both uh, aquaculture and wild fish crops. So that by, time T, by the time T3 rolls around, we've got some individuals that are just really jumping out ahead of the pack and leaving behind uh, the majority. And some are almost back where they started. They've hardly grown at all. And one thing that exacerbates this kind of growth dispersion problem is that if the fish is at all uh, predatory, and most fish are, um, then these big guys over here start to turn into cannibals. And they come back and bite the tail off the distribution. The small individuals become prey for the bigger individuals, which makes the distribution even more strongly skewed. Um, so that kind of thing happens regularly in fish hatcheries with fish like red drum, spotted sea trout, Um, another thing that can go on is that there can be a change in, uh, in quote, feeding habits um, that correspond with uh, growth past a certain size. For example, little fish like uh, largemouth bass shift from being zooplanktivores uh, to being piscivores. And that shift, depending on the situation, occurs at lengths that are somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 100, probably, millimeters. And once that shift occurs, then the ball game is a new ball game with a different W infinity. The return on investment for predation changes in hopefully an, a, an improved way so that suddenly the maximum size that could have been achieved by little largemouth bass feeding on zooplankton becomes much greater now that they're feeding on a little fish. And maybe the little fish they're feeding on are their own smaller siblings. And so that's another thing that can cause this distribution to really take off is you're, you're in a different stanza. Uh, here's some real data to... Uh, sort of uh, 
I guess, illustrate, maybe uh, titillate, uh, stimulate you to think about these things. These are data for red, from red, uh, for red Drum from a couple of ponds. Um, the data in blue are from Sea Center, Texas at Lake Jackson, and the data in red are from the Marine Development Center in Corpus. And uh, not sure just what's going on, but you can clearly see this strong bimodal uh, distribution in the Sea Center, Texas fish. Um, the distribution from the Marine Development Center looks more, you know, kind of like T3 here. Uh, but the distribution from these fish has a notch here at about 100 millimeters. Um, with um, increasing frequency on the right side of that. And then a fall. And we got some fish that are monsters out there. And, you know, anytime you see this sort of result, you have to wonder... Uh, is this really a member of this cohort? Because in hatcheries, uh, things happen. Fish move around either by magic or, or other force. And one other force might be uh, uh, birds like cormorants. You know, uh, grab a fish and start to lift it and drop it. And they drop it in a different pond than the one they took it out of. Or somebody makes a mistake, you know, they're sampling the fish with a seine and, and there's one fish left that didn't get seen or, you know, gets into the other pond. But anytime I see a 1,600 gram fish in a pond that has fish that are 200 grams, for the most part, i got to wonder how that guy got there and whether he belongs with the group or is, is he just a, you know, is he a, a genetic giant, an endocrine giant? Uh, I don't know. I may have said, I hope, and maybe I did, and maybe I didn't say when we were talking about bioenergetics that, you know, I have um, increasingly uh, less confidence about the constancy of the constants in the component functions of bioenergetics models. By that I mean I'm not confident that the exponent of weight stays at the same value for all values of weight. Um, and, I, and I hope I explained that one of those things that could, be, that could be going on is that the weight exponent for maximum consumption in Red Drum uh, looks like it... Uh, increases, that is, it becomes less negative. It starts out at about minus 0.3 and then comes backwards. Um, and so what this has is the effect of causing the consumption line and the uh, metabolism line to become parallel and perhaps even to diverge. And we think that that divergence happens, uh, that, the, that the bottleneck, as I think I've called it, maybe with you, maybe not, uh, occurs at about 100 grams. Well, isn't that interesting? You know, here's a 100 gram notch. It's like, you know, you're, you're all bunched up because you're trying to get past the bottleneck and fish are getting clumped and then some guys make it through and once you're through the bottleneck, you really take off. You know, it's another stanza. And I don't know if that's what's going on at the MDC or not, uh, nor, does, nor do my colleagues at the MDC know what, what could account for that. But it sure looks suspicious. Um, anyhow, these are the, the, this is reality. You know, you've got to make of it what you will. So now on to empirical growth models that have been fit to um, size at age or size through time data. Um, and I got a little preface for you first. And the, and the preface is that regardless of which one of the models you're going to adopt, uh, you might want to express growth rate 
as a function of growth or size already achieved rather than just expressing it as a change in size through time. Um, and that's because um, percent change for big fish is a lot less than for small fish, but the actual absolute change is a lot bigger. Now, shrimp people like to talk about growth without any regard for size already achieved as if it were a linear process. You know, you'll hear shrimp people talk about grams per day. And maybe that works over an interval. And we've done some, we've got a, we've got a, a shrimp version of the ecophys.fish model, ecophys.shrimp that Dr. Scott Walker developed. And he actually is able to uh, simulate the apparent linear increase in size of shrimp over an apparently fairly substantial interval. So I think that's why people in the shrimp business like to talk about linear growth. But in fish, for the most part, growth is not linear. And if it's not linear, then you need to scale it by the size already attained. So what you need to uh, compute to represent growth, I think, um, in a realistic way, is either the change in size over time per unit size initially, and that's so weight at time T2 minus weight at time T1 is the difference, hopefully positive, if you're going to make any money, divided by the weight at the starting point, T1, and then divided by the difference in time, T2 minus T1. So you end up with grams per gram per day, or pounds per pound per week or month or whatever. Um, that's dangerous even too because um, it depends on what the interval is between T2 and T1. If the growth process is happening at a very different rate inherently because of size scaling effects at the end of the interval versus at the beginning, then you're going to get a really strange number that's going to depend on the length of the interval over which growth is measured. And you protect yourself a little bit by, uh, instead of using weight initial, using a, a mean weight, and the mean that one ought to use, logically, is a geometric mean because growth is probably an exponentially connected process. If growth is positive and exponential, then W av, the geometric mean weight, uh, and, oh, and W av, the geometric mean weight, then growth rate as expressed in the second formula above is very nearly, but for some reason I can't quite do the math to figure out not quite the same as instantaneous growth. At least I don't believe it is. But it's similar. So I, I recommend this second form of the equation, although most of the aquaculture literature will use the first equation. And if you're comparing treatments uh, starting and ending at the same times so that the fish all start at the same size, and one treatment is a much better performer than another, then final weight's going to be different, but all the initial weights are... Then, then, then you're probably okay with this first expression. But, but if you're starting at different sizes in your different treatments and covering different intervals of time, then you'd be much better off using the second variant. So now I'll talk about um, the various empirical growth models that have been offered up and, and used widely in fisheries uh, and in other places. The first of these is the exponential that we've all come to know and love. Uh, it was popular, popularized, I, I say, by Brody in 1927. That was the first real uh, argument in favor. And what Brody said is that, you know, you got two phases. You got a pre inflection growth phase and a post inflection. He recognized that growth was not a simple uh, exponential. Uh, pre inflection growth is a positive exponential uh, function of time. And uh, so the derivative of weight with respect to time is a constant proportion of weight achieved. And the time integral for an exponential that looks like that, as you know by now, looks like this and can be linearized um, if, if you're lucky in all the ways the errors are distributed. And there's a problem with error distribution, but most people argue that you get 
reasonably unbiased estimates of the parameters by doing a log transform. Um, and so then once you've got the log transform, you can estimate the rate constant G as the difference in the logs, log weight uh, at time T2 minus log weight at time T1, divided by the difference in time. So unfortunately, that G, the instantaneous rate, is not going to be quite the same as the measure I think you get when you do this calculation. Not quite sure why. I thought it ought to be. So, you know, you, you find the instantaneous growth rate or the in instantaneous rate for any exponential process by taking the difference in the log beginning and end or end and minus beginning and dividing by the change in time. And that still would be the commonest way to hear growth rates described or compared is by talking about instantaneous rates. Um, not all growth is pre-inflection. Most of what we're interested in in aquaculture is pre-inflection because we're usually interested in small juvenile animals. But once you're looking at the whole lifespan, uh, that juvenile changes to a maturing individual and approaches an asymptotic weight, the weight infinity that we talked about. That's post-inflection growth. And post-inflection growth, Brody would say, follows a negative exponential or an exponential decay where what's decaying is the difference between the achieved weight at every moment and the ultimately achievable weight the weight infinity, the asymptotic weight, with uh, rate constant G again. And the time integral for a negative exponential looks like that. You'll see it again in lab today when we talk about um, heat transfer. You saw it in lab one when we talked about uh, uh, evacuation of stomach contents, except it was made simpler by the fact that um, w infinity was C infinity in lab one, and C infinity is zero. In other words, the exponential decay is going to zero value for the y co for the y variable. Here, it's not going to zero. It's actually going to a fixed value W infinity, which either could be higher or lower than weight zero. Normally, we would expect it to be higher. Again, it uh, can be linearized, except now you've got to take the logarithm of the difference between achieved weight at time t and weight infinity and regress that on the uh, time. You'd expect to have that be the intercept. So that's exponential, pre-inflection, post-inflection. Here's some other growth models that have come along and are... Uh, more widely accepted nowadays, I guess. One of those is the power model of Parker and Larkin, a couple of Canadian fisheries folks. The Canadians have been very dominant in this whole field all along. Uh, Pre-inflection growth um, can be described as a power function of weight already achieved as opposed to directly proportional to the weight already achieved. So you see the difference between the power and the exponential you probably see that the exponential is simply a special <coughs> case of the power function. A special case where x is equal to 1. dw dt is g times w. Instead of being w to the 1, it's w to the x. And um, that x causes lots of complications. The time integral of that is a lot messier than the time integral for the exponential. But still, it's, uh, it's tractable. It uh, has a closed form solution, we say, meaning that you can write an exact explicit equation for y as a function of the other variables. In this case, weight. The magnitude of this x coefficient, according to Parker and Larkin, is uh, between 0.5 and 0.7. 
And what they thought was that it reflects the fraction of the mass of the animal that's metabolically active. And since the proportion of a big fish that's metabolically active becomes less as it grows bigger and bigger than for a small fish, that's why the thing is 0.5 to 0.7 instead of 1. That's what Parker and Larkin said. So they would say that G represents an instantaneous rate, of course, that's biologically uh, constrained but depends on ecological opportunity, but that the X is sort of intrinsic with the species, maybe with the feed. Uh, it's kind of interesting to compare the exponential, straight exponential with... Uh, with uh, power function and uh, quickly shows you why the exponential can get you into real trouble if you extrapolate it too far out into the future. Suppose we've got a, a little fish that has a one gram weight initially. Um, that G is not to be confused with this G. This is a dimension here, one gram, and this is G, the instantaneous rate. G here, I should have used a uh, italics or bold or whatever they do to distinguish between variables and parameters. And anyhow, everybody got me right. Weight zero is one gram. The instantaneous rate co uh, uh, is one per unit of time. X, we're going to assume, is 0.7, sort of representative. And the question becomes, what is W at time T under the exponential model, positive exponential, versus under the power model? So everybody starts at 1 at time 0. Then at time 1, under the exponential model, we're at 2.7 grams, one time step. Could be one week, one month, one day, I guess. Um, 2, we're at 7, 4, and 4, 8. And we're still okay at 3 units, but look what happens. By the time we get to 10 units of time, um, the positive exponential with the same coefficient g gives 22,000 units of grams versus only 102 grams. So, you know, when you do your experiment over eight weeks or ten weeks, Valdemar and Ishan and Alejandro, those guys are aquaculture guys back there, you know, exponential, uh, one exponential rate is probably not going to work over that same time. So what we say is that the exponential rate gets smaller and smaller when we take this difference, you know, over. It's a little dangerous, in other words, to go week 10 minus week 1 or week 0 and calculate the instantaneous rate uh, because you're probably not going to have that kind of growth. So here's some, again, real data. And the data are for Red Drum uh, fitted to... Uh, Experimental work by Mike Gray. You'll hear Mike's name again today in, in lab. Mike uh, did a nice drawing of a, a heat transfer model that we used in biology of fishes some time ago. But what Mike did in his master's work was to compare um, growth rates and other stuff for red drum being fed uh, a pelleted uh, feed, rangan, and being fed shrimp meat. Mike peeled a lot of shrimp. Um, and because he had to peel a lot of shrimp, he only did the, he only did shrimp uh, for the small fish in his three treatments. And But the bigger fish, uh, the other two size classes, the medium and large sized fish, he fed rangan only. So, the R stands for Rangan, and uh, the S stands for shrimp, and the green triangles here are shrimp-fed fish, and the other colors um, are, well, triangles are small fish, and if they're purple, then they're fed Rangan, and then these, uh, these sort of magenta or whatever color that is, fish or medium fish fed Rangan, and then the little blue uh, diamonds are fish fed uh, uh, large fish fed Rangan. And right away you see that the 
percent change in weight um, observed and modeled uh, depends a lot on the size of the fish at the start of the experiment, just as you'd expect. Um, and I'm not sure, let's see, does it say in here what, how long these fish were? Red drum weight change, percent per day, uh, actual versus modeled, Parker and Larkin model with an, with an X. In this case, the best fitting X was only 0.52. Uh, data from Mike Gray's feeding trial, fish weights range from 20 to 40 grams for small fish to 120 to 315 for large fish. Uh, value of G was 0.135 that maximized goodness of fit for Rangan fed fish, but 0.180 for shrimp fed fish. So looks like shrimp's a better feed. Not much surprise there, I guess. Um, these fish were kept in individual tanks and hand-fed individually. So he knew which he knew individual fish uh, responses. And you can see the fit's not bad for, uh, you know, with this uh, exit 0.52 for both uh, types of feed. Um, the difference in the type of feed just moves them further or up or down along the one-to-one -one line so that Shrimp fed uh, fish, small fish, grew at almost 4% per day, um, which is not bad for 20 to 40 gram fish. And uh, the Rangan fish were somewhere below 3% per day. So you ask, well, how does that look if you fit um, exponential model as opposed to uh, uh, power model? 0.68 here is the R squared. And there's the exponential. And, of course, the, there is no spread along this axis because um, there's only, you know, it's always, uh, there's no, uh, it's not a function of the difference in weight. These are all um, only different because the Gs are different. This is the best fitting Gs for all of the Rangan fish. And here are the best fitting G's for all of the uh, shrimp fed fish. Let me read this and make sure I'm not misleading you there. The value for G was 0.018 for Rangan fish and 0.038 for shrimp fed fish. Um, so the variance goes way up once you fail to take into account the fact that fish with different weights have inherent dif inherently different rates. That, you know, it's not just weight to the one times G, it's weight to a power, um, which means every fish has an effectively different weight. That's the reason that these are all on, on the same, at the same point on, on the x-axis. Uh, R squared is 0.458 in this case as compared to 0 0.6805 there. Um, I have a little note down here. The fitted model is the power model with X equals 0 0.999. And that's because uh, when you try to fit the model with uh, X equal to 1, it blows up. So you have to fake it a little bit. So um, this sort of shows you what happens as you move toward the optimum. So with Parker Larkin power closer to what they said would be right, 0.8. You get this fit, and notice the Rangan fed fish are no longer one to one on the one to one line. The regression line is actually tilted like this. So you can see what's happening. As X goes to one, this, ver this line just goes vertical. This red line. Right now it's for X equals 0.8. Uh, when X goes to 0.52, the line tilts down and takes on the first position I showed you. So it's a good fit, optimized fit at 0.52. So other models. Um, how about von Bertalanffy? Um, paper published in 1938. Um, uh, was the original source of von Bertalanffy's model. I'm still trying to get my hands on that, the original paper from 1938. Um, 
along in uh, the mid-60s, uh, some more Canadians, Lloyd Dickey and uh, his student, a guy named Palahimo, um, reconsidered von Bertalampi's model for fish, for salmonids. Um, the way von Bertalampi originally conceived his model was very nice and neat and logical and appealed to a lot of people. He said, well, um, growth ought to reflect the difference in any animal. And actually, the animal he was thinking about were human babies. That's what the original paper was written about. Um, growth ought to reflect the difference between food absorbed in the gut and the food that's metabolized by the, by the growing organism. So it's a difference, you know. Growth rate is absorbance, absorption rate minus growth respiration rate. And he thought that food absorbed ought to be proportionate to the surface area of the gut. And that food metabolized should be directly proportional to weight. And so that led to the original uh, version of von Bertalanffy's differential equation, uh, where S here stands for surface and H is a coefficient, absorptance coefficient. And M is some metabolic coefficient, and W is the mass of the animal. So what I want to show you is something I don't think you'll see anyplace else, although it's straightforward. And I hope you'll uh, hang on to these notes and use them to your own advantage at some point. I want to show you the convergence of von Bertalampi's model as it is fit to fishery data to describe the growth of observed fish stocks and the bioenergetics model that we've talked about, the convergence in a mathematical sense. So we're going to do a little math, but it's not heavy math. You know, there's no integration in it at all. It's just the differential form. But first thing we're going to do is convert uh, S to weight. Uh, and what we're going to assume is what's called isometry. And I don't know if we've talked about isometry versus allometry, but I think we may have. You know, isometry says that a three-dimensional object is growing in all of its linear dimensions at the same rate. So if it's a, if it's a uh, rectanguloid solid, it keeps, you know, you can't tell whether you're seeing it from far away or close up. You know, is it bigger and it's further away or is it close up? And it's, you know what I'm saying. In other words, the shape relationships stay the same if growth is isometric. But if growth is allometric, then the dimensions in one, uh, one set of dimensions grow at a different rate from another. So you, you go from something long and skinny to sh something short and stubby. So if you assume isometric growth, and you, and you really don't have much basis for assuming anything else, even though we all know that it's not quite, then you start out by saying, well, surface area has got to be proportionate to a length squared. Um, and so surface then is, uh, the, the square root of surface is directly proportional to length. Now you might need to do this on prelims at some point, you graduate students, so it's good to know this little trick, you know. S is length squared proportional. Therefore, S to the point 0.5 is directly proportional to length. Weight is proportional to the cubic a cubic power of length if it's isometric. But anybody that's ever done, you know, uh, condition factor analysis in fish knows that it's not always three. You know, it varies with size and conditions. But we're going to assume three. And if that's true, then the cubic root of weight is directly proportional to length. And so we can write that S to the 0.5 is directly proportional to weight to the 0.33. You know, uh, it's just like equalities. You know, if one thing is equal to another and another thing is equal to one of the things, then the two things are equal to each other. In this case, it's proportional to. Therefore, um, surface to the point 0.5 is proportional to weight to the point 0.33, or surface is proportional to weight to the point 0.67, two-thirds power. And if you accept that, then you can just substitute uh, for S, you can substitute weight to the two-thirds power. Now, you've got to change your co coefficient 
So I'm now calling it a new coefficient, but it's still a constant. It's h prime now, and all it did was convert the dimensions. So instead of h, we got h prime. We still got this minus m times w sitting over here. Um, okay, now a little leap. We have to recognize that change in weight with respect to time is the uh, growth rate instantaneously multiplied times the total weight. In other words, grams per gram per day multiplied times total grams gives you grams per day growth rate, right? So if you want to talk about DWDT, then you need to write DWDT as W times AG. Is everybody with me on that one? If you're growing at a gram per gram per day, and you weigh 100 grams, then you're growing 100 grams per day. Usually fish don't grow that fast. Although some of you in the exam I happen to notice had fish growing at 500% of body weight per day. Won't name any names here. So um, if you, if you uh, make that substitution, all I'm doing here is replacing... Um, Replacing DWDT over here with W times AG. And then I'm going ahead and dividing through in one step. I failed. To, I probably should have made it two steps. Dividing the whole equation through by W to get, to get this. This is AG times W divided by W is just AG, right? All of this divided by W is all of this divided by W or times weight to the minus one. Okay, now we can do the multiplication over here and we end up with H prime times weight two instead of the plus point six seven. We got a minus one and a plus point six seven to multiply the numbers you add the exponents. So you end up with minus point three three here. And you end up with M times W to the zero. What's W to the zero? It's one. So weight falls out of the second term. So we end up with something that's very similar to the bioenergetic scope model for growth that I talked to you about. And we can even write the equivalencies down. We can say that, well, H prime must be equal to 0.6C. And that M must be equal to S. Except for one little problem, and that is that the per unit weight rate of metabolism was implied originally by Von Bertalanti to be weight independent. That little babies and old big people all have metabolic rates that are weight independent. Well, all that got, you know, changed over time since 1938. And I'm going to do something that I haven't done yet. I'm going to post a paper that, as far as I know, it is the last thing that von Bertalanthe published. And he was still publishing in 1957. And the very first sentence of that paper with somebody else, Libowitz, I think Libowitz was the second author, uh, said something like, it is well established that metabolism varies as a function of animal size, meaning per unit rate of metabolism varies as a function of animal size. Well, Palahimo and Lloyd Dickey knew that very well. They knew that it's not weight to the one up here, it's weight to about 0.8, as I told you when we talked about metabolic rates. The standard metabolism is proportional roughly to weight to the 0.8. And if routine metabolism is under Winberg's rule twice standard, then routine metabolism is also proportional to weight to the 0.8. If that's true, and you got weight to the 0.8 here instead of weight to the 1, you uh, multiply by weight to the minus 1, you get weight to the minus 0.02, or I mean minus 0.2. Weight to the minus point two. We know, as did Palahimo and Dickey, 
that standard metabolic rate in fish is in fact typically proportional to weight to minus 0.2. Maybe it's minus 0.25 in mammals. Once that correction is made, uh, in quotes, we got the bioenergetic scope model. That the rate of growth is some constant times weight to the minus 0.33 minus uh, some constant times weight to the minus 0.2. And if you look back in your notes, you'll see that that's virtually identical, I guess. Maybe this was minus 0.3 instead of 0.33. And in fact, I think that rate coefficient varies all over the place. I think it's like 0.5 for redfish, minus 0.5. Uh, I say, or does it converge, you know? And I slipped something in on you here. I wanted to see if anybody would catch it. Uh, somebody was supposed to say, wait a minute, Dr. Nealis. That's AG there. That's not AG max. Um, the truth is, von Bertalampe's model has been applied in fisheries to describe the growth of the average fish in the stock. An empirical, an observed growth rate. Whereas our bioenergetic scope model says that this is the maximum possible size, biologically. So, you know, I think that's one of the most astounding things that all this uh, argument leads to. The von Bertalampe model has been applied to describe the observed growth of the average individual in stock of wild fish, whereas the bioenergetic scope model deals with AG max under optimum, not average, conditions. Here's what I conclude. That the convergence of these two models mathematically suggests, I wouldn't say must, maybe maybe that's a little too strong a word, that wild fish typically achieve a proportion of their maximum <coughs> consumption that is not necessarily uh, uh, at one level or another, but it's weight independent. That little fish do just as well getting their... Uh, their percentage of maximum daily ration achieved is about the same as the maximum daily ration percentage achieved by the bigger fish in the stock. And why in the world would that be so? I think it's so, if it's so, because evolution has matched up uh, the size of fish and the availability of resources to support fish of that size so that everybody's got about an equal shake. Little fish and big fish within the species. I can't see any other logical argument that would account for it. Um, the debate about von Bertalanffy and whether it describes reality for fish or not it continues to this moment. Um, and it's actually the moment extends beyond the moment I want to tell you about because I didn't have time to incorporate any new slides. In fact, I'm not sure enough of myself to incorporate new slides. But I was sure enough um, to make this slide a year or so ago. The case has been made that von Bertalanffy was right after all recently that the weight power from metabolism is in fact one despite all empirical data to the contrary. Um, and I, I learned that when I was asked to review a paper. And the case was made in that paper. And I said, wait a minute. You know, this flies in the face of what I know about fish metabolism. And in probing, I think the reason that some folks have gone back to von Bertalanffy in its original form is because I don't think there is a closed form solution for the integral if in fact that second term has weight to a different power than the first term or weight to something other than one. In other words, I don't think you can integrate and I've got the best mathematician I know working on it right now and I think I already had somebody else who was a very good mathematician tell me that no, there is no closed form solution meaning that the only way to find the integral for weight knowing dwdt if in fact dwdt is 
an absorption term that's one power of weight minus a, a metabolism term that's a different power of weight and weight not to the one, the only way to find the solution for weight as a function of t, time t, and the parameters is to numerically integrate it as opposed to just solving the matrix to get the coefficients. In other words, there's, you know, if you write, you can write an equation for weight as a function of time, but it has an infinite number of terms, or at least it's very complicated, if not endless. So I think it was just a matter of, of mathematical convenience that these folks have decided that, hey, you know, it's, let's just take weight to the one. And really, if you look at empirical data, you can't tell the difference based on just the data from the field. You know, it depends on the coefficients. They're very different. So I went through and I did the numeric integration uh, for time from zero out to 50 for some arbitrary case. All I was interested in was what's the difference in the way von Bertelampy looks with weight to the one versus a best-fitting analog the bioenergetic scope analog with weight to the 0.8. And you can see the result. I don't think most empirical data are sufficiently tight enough. If you just had size of fish through time, which is what biologists have been fitting, I don't think the data are tight enough to resolve which is the correct uh, expression. But if you take weight to the one up here, like this, the von Bertalanffy original, then you can find, the, I, even I can do that integration. So it's easy to write the exact value of weight at any time t in forever. But if you take weight to the point eight, the only way to get there from here is to just say, what is this, and what is this, and what is this? And actually, I've got the Excel sheet where I worked this out where you can plug in different values for the exponents and stuff, and then it'll immediately... And I'm going to add that to the uh, handout, the Excel functional relationships thing, and maybe a couple of other growth models, too, I'm going to add in there that I've come, become interested in. Okay, well, that worked out about right. We're done for today. And we got a lab, and we need to do it. You know, I'm tired, you're tired, but we need to do it. You're going to do it? All right, good deal. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop, and we'll be back together here locally at 2 today.